unwise to lower your defenses. There is no way of knowing when the dark side may rise up again. During the hours of darkness, the Empire could be refueling for the attack. Will the armored Sentinel transport vehicle be ready to retaliate before it's too late? Will the rebel force be strong enough to deal with the Imperial stormtroopers? Only you can decide with Star Wars toys. It's new Zuckers, four long, and the Imperial TIE Fighter pilot. Three 48 action figures from Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back collection, each sold separately. And now from Star Wars Radio Free Endor collection, it's Jamie and Paul action figures. Not yet available in any stores for free with six proofs of purchase from any Star Wars action figures. Details on specially marked packs of participating stores. Offer expires September 30th, 1983. New four long Zuckers, Imperial TIE Fighter pilot, and other action figures sold separately from Palace. Toy, Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back Collection. No. 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 Yes. Hi. From the forest moon of Endor. Radio Free Endor. Star Wars Podcast. Bringing you news and reviews of the galaxy far, far away. Welcome to episode 34 of Radio Free Endor, and it's all about collecting. And we're talking vintage Star Wars collecting here with Matt Fox. And with shows like The Toys That Made Us by Netflix, and with the new exhibition May The Toys Be With You making its way around the country, now is the time to relive them days when there's no mobile phones or consoles, it was just action figures, play sets and your imagination which took you to the galaxy far far away and back again. But before that, let's introduce my good friend and co-host for this month, official Star Wars artist Jason W. Chrisman! How you doing Jason? Hello! I am great. I'm so glad to be back. And it's great to have you back, Jason. Now, you've been doing a lot of Comic Cons, haven't you? Yeah, I, I have been doing a lot of Comic Cons. Uh, since there's no Star Wars Celebration this year, I've been trying to add a couple extra Comic Cons into the mix. Mm. And uh, so I did Dragon Con for the first time this year in Atlanta, Yeah, which is pretty much you know there's no big vendors there like lego and marvel and you know, they're not there yeah but it's like it's it's huge they have a huge parade it's four days it's five stories of convention hall uh area i didn't realize it was four days that looks that sounds amazing i usually find with conventions after two days you've done everything and seen everything but four day convention that's mind-boggling yeah four days are pretty tiring by the end uh emerald city in seattle is four days new york comic con's four days hmm. um and uh but dragon con it's like a 24-hour party there it just doesn't stop yeah. you go to any of the hotels which are all right across the street from each other and it's just nothing but cosplaying until you know the wee morning hours and it's pretty amazing i was pretty blown away by it now what kind of artwork did you take to sell this time because you've got some new prints haven't you done uh well i've got the speeder series which i did uh a year ago which have uh, i'm making my rounds with those at the moment uh my firefly print which i'm also a huge fan of uh does really well at comic cons as well hmm. but you know at dragon con i have to say my table is right next to uh henry gilroy hmm. you know star wars rebels executive producer and writer in clone wars and it was such an honor to sit next to him and swap stories about being a fan and then listening to him about his writing techniques. And yeah. I was just blown away by that, by him. Did he give you any uh, any secrets into any plots or any storylines that might be coming up? Is he is he involved in the, in the new Clone Wars that uh, is coming back? Well, I probed a little bit. I tried yeah. to probe. He was he, he was very tight lipped. I, I give him credit for that. <laughs> he has to be, it? So, they, have to be. they don't want that um, call from Disney, do they? They're all scared. Right. It's like the mafia, isn't it? You know, my son and I, we loved Star Wars Rebels so much. Uh, we looked forward to that show every week when it when it was on. Sir, the fuel. I gave you a direct order.
And, uh, and you know, when Kanan died in that, you know, spoiler alert, yeah. my son couldn't handle it. It was a, it was, we had a, you know, we had to have, you know, the death talk pretty much, you know, and uh, it was a very emotional for him. He didn't want to watch it anymore after that. And, uh, and you know, we were, but we both got emotional and I was telling him that story and he said, you know, well, he wrote that scene and he said he cried when he wrote it. Oh, yeah, it is a very powerful scene. It was, yeah. Mm, yeah, I must admit, even I was watching, I was thinking, wow, they've actually, they went and did it. Do you know what I mean? They, they did. did it. And it seemed like quite a, an adult episode, if you know what I mean, Jason, compared right. to, you know, for the for the, uh, for the the age range that Rebels was sort of aiming for. And I think Rebels sort of went the same way the Clone Wars went. First of all, Clone Wars was very, very kiddie orientated. But as it went, it started to get a bit more serious, more adultish. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I yeah. felt that uh, Rebels had done the same. Because by the time it got to the the final episode, whoa! I was, you know, you, everybody was on board and buying the, the nails. And I remember before Rebels started, I was thinking, oh, really? It doesn't look like Clone Wars. Do I really want to watch it? And I'm now I'm glad I had because it's an absolutely extraordinary uh, series. And I hope that Star Wars Resistance will win me over the way the Rebels did. I think it will. I think it's going to have the same, you know. Uh, ramp up you know it'll be fun at first and then it'll get serious and and we're gonna have you know we're gonna get invested in the characters and you know we, we might lose some you know he said you know they had to let Ezra grow up and it was really the only way to do it was to lose Kanan yeah and uh, and I thought that was a really great little insight that he said there so yeah it's a it says a really good show and it made me <laughs> You know the end part of uh, Rebels when uh, you saw Ahsoka, and um, Dave Filoni had this idea that Captain Rex was one of the rebels that stormed the bunker. Right. Yeah. And he even and he even did him in, in the outfit as well. Amazing. I like that kind of. I like that. Yeah, kind that of was so, that was that was a great connection that they made. It there. was. It was. It was. Now this um, Dragon Con. What else did you see there? Was there because what is Dragon Con for anyone in the UK listening? What is Dragon Con about? It's just like any other Comic Con, really. There's, uh, I'm, but they do have. Uh, I think the extra things that they have at Dragon Con that's not at other places is the parade for one. Mm. Uh, the parade is fantastic. I mean, they had a, a life size, you know, or near to life size Java sand crawler. I mean, they had amazing stuff. I didn't get to really see it because I was at my table the whole time, but I saw video footage and I got to see some of the after stuff. They have uh, a film festival, uh, which is really great, uh, which yeah. some of my friends have been in in the past years. Uh, and, you know, but there's no big vendors. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just uh, table after table and booth after booth of, you know, s some really great products and, and some not so great, just like at every Comic Con. Um, the cosplay is probably one of the better cosplay I've seen at other than it? other cons. Yeah, so people really get into it, and I'm just really surprised at this point that there's not any major vendors there. It's it was shocking to me that there yeah. wasn't, just from the sheer size of it. Now, did you take your son to this one? Uh, no, he's only come to me to the local one, which is Portland Rose City Comic Con. Yeah, I keep making empty promises. I'm going to bring him to another one, but you know, it's always during school years and. But I, I do have one promise that I will keep, and if I make it into Star Wars Celebration 2019 in Chicago, I promised I would take him with me, uh, no matter what. Yeah, so. I noticed that uh, when he was, he, he posted some photos of uh, one of the conventions you took him to, and he had some fans, didn't he? Yeah, he had he had you know half dozen fans come, and he had uh, we had him uh, some fan T-shirts made for him. And, uh, you know, if anyone came and said that they were a fan and had subscribed to his channel, uh, he gave them a T-shirt, yeah. you know, to show his to show his, you know, love of their support and got pictures with them. And uh, yeah. and it's been a, it's been a great experience for him. Yeah. Have you got any links to to his channel? Well, uh, uh, it's YouTube dot com forward slash Caden Skywalker. It's K-A-I-D-E-N. Yeah. Uh, since I am his editor. And uh, so over the next few months, there's going to be quite a few updates that are going to be up there. Um, and then, of course, you know, we're we're doing uh, we're building our own R2 unit 
that we're just starting. So, uh, which him and I are going to be part of and doing together. So we're, we're going to be recording that and posting all our updates and showing what the process is over the next, you know, two years probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, of what it takes to build one of those so i know they are um, they, they do take an awful lot of time but just think of what you've got at the end of it it'll be amazing it's going to be amazing yeah you know talking about uh, your son caden's uh, youtube channel one of my particular favorite ones uh, jason was his his look around a star wars store with all the vintage star wars figures and well some vintage and some not so vintage but um, i was amazed where was where was this store? It's not far from us. It's like just seven miles away, and it's a, it's a, a strip mall that's outside of a mall. You know, it's like one of those little outside the mall stores. Um, it just popped up one day, and I, I was like, "What is this?" And we went there, and we took some video footage of it, and we looked at every single thing they had. They got so much vintage stuff there too that you can buy. Yeah, uh, you know, I came very close to buying an R two D two fish tank. You know that. Not too fish tank. It was from the '90s, I guess, yeah. and uh, I didn't. I didn't because I have no place to put it. But it is a, a real amazing store, and I have to keep myself from going there uh, a lot. Whenever I drive by, I'm like, I should just stop at that store. God, but uh, I know what you mean. I'll be like, you know, my Mickey, <laughs> she'd be like, I wonder where Jamie is. I'll be in this store. Yeah, I mean, because they've even got a massive... If you've got a look at this uh, video, folks, I will post a link to this video, right? But this is like a massive, massive Chewbacca. And it's about as big as Caden, isn't it? It's massive. Oh, yeah, they've got huge statues. Uh, Darth Maul, Darth Vader, Chewbacca. It's like a teddy bear, though, isn't it? <laughs> it's like yeah, a, a massive teddy bear sitting on the floor. It's great. It's great. I, I tend to lean towards the, the vintage aisle that has all the... Mm-hmm you know figures that i used to play with yeah and then he tends to lean towards the lego side of the store because you know he's he's a big lego fan so am i yes but um and then we he he always ends up leaving with uh, not a lego and not an action figure but he always ends up uh, getting some kind of uh foam weapon you know the the fake the fake giant you know uh weapons that you can you know hit each other with you know And his uh, recent one was um, a uh, uh, the axe that Jabba's uh, guards have. The Gamorrean guards. Yes, yes. The, yeah. Those those giant axes that they have. That's his most recent purchase. Yeah, you can see him swinging one of these axes. And I was thinking, that looks just like the, the action figure axe. It's like he's just made it bigger. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he. I think in the video he drops it. It bounces, you know. It's just, <laughs> yeah. you know. You drop it, it, you bite, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I I really want the uh, Tuscan Raider uh, club that they have there too. That's yeah, cool. they uh, could see the price on them, Jason. They were like, they were only twenty bucks. That ain't bad. Yeah. That's no, shit. no, that's not that bad is. at all. Yeah. yeah, that's why we're able to walk away with one every time we go there. So. Yeah, I tell you what, it's absolutely a fantastic store. I wish there was something in this store uh, with that kind of thing. But um, especially with collecting, and we have got a, a fantastic interview with Matt Fox, who owns a massive collection in the UK, which is actually on at the Newark Museum in Leicester at the moment, Jason. Now, I went down to this one, and it was kind of weird, you know, Jason. They had all these star wars vintage action figures behind glass cases you know it's dead strange that i have got these same action figures and i am standing in a museum looking at stuff behind glass in a museum of stuff that i've got in my shed oh that's awesome and and were you thinking to yourself why is my stuff not behind glass (laughs) (laughs) it will be (laughs) (laughs) well speaking of collectors when i was in seattle at the emerald city comic con back in march I was invited to an after party and he said, I have to go there. And he didn't tell me why. He's like, trust me, you have to be there. You'll know why when you get there. And I said, oh, okay, you know, and I, you know, I'm not a big after party person, but I, I didn't have any other plans uh, on any of the nights there. So I decided to go and I, I Ubered my way up to it. And uh, when I got there, he ha- I was on a list and I was like, ah, so I was impressed with that. Yeah. And I, and it was just a ha- regular house in, the, in a regular neighborhood. And as soon as I walk in the door, this place was the largest collection of Star Wars memorabilia I've ever seen in my life. And I'm not talking about action figures and toys. I'm talking real life 
filmed on screen memorabilia yeah uh from the basement to the attic and in the in the bathrooms and the kitchens it was everywhere from harrison ford's you know uh director's chair with his name on it still to pieces of you know walls that yeah. were you know from you know indoor uh bunkers I and mean, he had uh, every kind of mask you can imagine uh, a lot of stuff was you know old and falling apart but it was all you know, encased and protected, and I was I was blown away. I didn't even know whose house it was. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know if I met the owner of the place. You know, I, I really uh, it, there was a you know quite a few people there. The, you know, the five hundred one was there. The Joy Builders were there. Yeah, and it was just uh, apparently he's a, a good friend of uh, Steve Sansweet and uh, from Rancho Obi Wan. Mm. So. And, and I'm sure, you know, Steve Sansweet has probably been there and drooling over a lot of this guy's stuff as well. I bet you he's uh, uh, put in an offer for some of that stuff as well. Uh, probably, probably. Yeah. But unbelievably blown away. I'll, uh, I'll send you some photos of that. Oh, yes, some please. Yeah, we'll stick them on our um, Instagram. And uh, we'll, we'll also do a link to your Instagram as well, Jason. Now, when it comes to collecting, what's your favorite out of the, the of stuff that you've got? I'm very particular. I have little things. I don't want to fill up every, you know, I can't put it all over the house. I have it more contained to my office mm. at the, for the most part. But, uh, I mean, if I look around, you know, I have more art than anything else. Mm. Um, but I got a couple little things here and there that I like to keep out. Uh, uh, I've got these little busts. Uh, you know, just of, of, you know, the shoulders up uh, statues oh, yeah. of a stormtrooper wearing a suit and Boba Fett wearing a suit. And I like to bring those to Comic-Cons with me and put them on the table with my business cards in front of them. It's a nice little little thing that I uh, purchased when I was at a Comic-Con in Canada. And uh, I have a, a broken Stormtrooper helmet that's been kind of patinaed with uh, a plant growing out of the top of it. That's one yeah. of my favorite things right there. Ah. Right. So I, you know, I like unique things, things you can't find mm. online or, you know, just weird things that people have created. That's my yeah. favorite thing to collect. So I like to collect unique items. Unique. Yeah. Yeah. Unique artwork, you know, and, you know, even these little sculptures have their little pieces of art. You know, it's not stuff that I can go buy at, you know, Target or, mm. or places like that. I like unique little things like that. Yeah, I must admit, I've got a couple of little bits and bobs above my workstation of my PC. I've got, um, I went and bought some of these, uh, they're in the pound shop, or well, the dollar store in, you know, where you live, but it, down here is the pound shop. And they were like these little Star Wars, what do they call them? They're like little bags and you, you don't know what's in them. And you rip them open and inside is like really small little figures or ships or characters. And it's like, mm-hmm. I've got a really teeny weeny Rancor. I oh, mean, that's cool. He's, he's no bigger than maybe a 50 pence piece, if you know what a 50 pence piece that's is cool. like. That's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. the kind of stuff I like. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a pretty cool, unique little piece. Though. Yeah, and um, I have got, in my collection as well, I finally got myself um, a Palatoy Atat. It's not complete because it's really hard to get some complete ones. So uh, to tell the truth, I'll probably spend more buying the two front guns than perhaps the whole thing. If you know what I mean, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I've got a couple like you, Jason. I've got some, uh, got some uh, artwork. Uh, I've got some artwork from yourself, which I will be getting up once I get my media room. That's going up in there, and um, I've got one that's um, um, my my niece bought me a couple of years ago, and it's uh, I've, I've said it a couple of times on the on the podcast. It's it's Darth Vader posting a letter into R two D two. But I've managed to get it signed by Dave Prowse and Kenny oh, Baker. Yeah. yeah, both of them are signed the same thing. So that's my pride and joy, that is. I've got a couple of bits of bobs actually signed by Dave Prowse. <laughs> he signed more more of everything than anyone. But saying that with Dave Prowse, he's no longer signing now, Jason. I know, and I'm really sad about that. Because I have that Star Wars portfolio book of mine, of my prints, yeah. that I've been having uh, everyone sign every chance I could get. Mm. And I was, you know, really hoping one day to, to, to find him and have him sign it. And that's never going to happen now. Yeah, we'll try and sort you out, Jason. We'll, pop, we'll try and sort you something out. We know, at, at the last Comic-Con I was at, which was here in Portland in my hometown, uh, one of uh, Droid Builders uh, came to my booth and said, you know what, I saw one of your prints at another booth that was going for $750. And I was oh, all, no. I was all, you're, you got to be joking me. And I, I said, show me. 
So we walked over there, and and it was a booth of uh, it was an autograph booth. Yeah. Uh, of you know just uh, photos of you know Mark Hamill, and it was signed and things like that. And the whole booth was filled with framed art of signed memorabilia. And um, sure enough, there was my print from Star Wars Celebration Anaheim in 2015, and it was signed by uh, Carrie Fisher and Peter Mayhew. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, "This is a bootleg. It's not. It's not the. It's not the actual size of the print. It was half the size of the actual print. And all. And it was photoshopped on the bottom to remove all of the Star Wars Celebration and copyright information." Mm. I was like, I don't know whether to be happy or sad about this because yeah. you know it's it was cool to see my print signed, you know, by Carrie Fisher and Peter, uh, but I was distraught by you know the bootleg copy of my print. Yeah, <laughs> I time. would be too. So I I talked to the guy and and he said you know well he buys all of the stuff from a vendor. Mm. He doesn't print any of the stuff himself. He just yeah. buys them and resells them. Uh, but he was so happy to see me that I was the artist of the print. He, be, he didn't care where it came from. He was just happy to know that, hey, this is the actual artist of the print is here. And he took it out of the picture frame and begged me to sign it. <laughs> My God. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, you know, so I signed it. Mm. But I, I signed it at the bottom where I would normally sign it on that particular print. Yeah. And then, and then just below that, I, I wrote in fine print, bootleg copy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, here you go. So I don't know if I increase the value or decrease the value of the print. That's unbelievable. <laughs> said, That's unbelievable that someone he could not be bothered to buy one of your prints to get it signed, and he felt himself he had to print one off himself. I know exactly where he got the print. As far really? as you know, it's off the internet, I could tell it's got the little halo, or you know, it was a it, it was a bad copy of it. I yeah. mean, the detail was not there, but that was a very interesting encounter. Do you think? Um, do you think the signatures were uh, authentic, or do you think they were bootleg as well? Uh, no, no, the, those those were one hundred percent real, and they you know were all certified. Um, I have both of their autographs as well, and I, I had uh, I immediately grabbed my book the next day and brought it back and and compared them, mm. and uh, it was theirs. There, it was 100 percent there, so there's no question oh, about amazing. that. Amazing! That is an amazing story. That who would have thought? Eh? Who would have thought? Right. I'll tell you what, Jason. What we'll do now is we'll get into a bit of news, shall we? Do it. You've taken your first step into a larger world. <laughs> We've got some... How are you How are you on spoilers, Jason? Are you, are you okay on spoilers? Well, not spoilers. I think these are more like rumours. I'm okay with that. I don't mind at all. That's a good. That's good. Now, there was something that came up online, and it said a Star Wars 9, huge leak, right, about a traitor for Star Wars Episode 9. Now, it says, according to... There is a lot of spiel on this, and uh, yeah, I did go around to a couple of websites, and they have all got it. But they reckon that the First Order have got a double agent. I can't see this myself, right? But it's none other than General Hux. That he's a mole. He's the one that ordered the launch of the Star Killer base to destroy all those planets. Yeah, that's a that's a reach for me. Yeah, that's the only thing I was thinking. Well, he would have done that unless they're trying to wreck on him. I don't mm-hmm. know. Well, he does hate he does hate Kylo. I mean, you can you know they hate each other pretty mm. pretty much, right? So maybe maybe he's maybe he's not so much trying to become a traitor, but more of a backstabber to I don't know. But mm. yeah, well, it could be a, a legitimate reason for him to go contact the, um, the, the the resistance and say look listen I'll give you Carlo Ren if you uh, you know keep me safe sort of thing because he sorts he, he does look the sort that would have no backbone and he, he'll, he'll do whatever is good and to keep himself alive Carlo Ren will probably kill him <laughs> you know what I mean it's understandable he's right. especially he's, you know what I mean he's gonna cause how many times did he get get chucked around in the uh, the last Jedi oh yeah yeah, I, mean, I felt I felt his pain on that one. Yeah, yeah. It, I like his character. I, I'd hate to see him become a traitor. Uh, I think he should, you know, 
stick with his with with the role he has. Yeah. You know, I think you know if if there is a traitor, I think it might be maybe one of the new characters that are coming in. Mm. That uh, there's a lot of new actors, good actors that are going to be in it. Uh, you know, Billy D. Williams is going to be in it. Maybe you know, maybe he's a traitor again. Oh my God. <laughs> well, yeah, there is you know? there is caught there, there has been some um, stories in his past where he has switched sides from. From wherever the money is, he plays, really. He plays both sides. He has, he, yeah. I mean, you know, he's redeemed himself in Return of the Jedi. Mm. Uh, but uh, you know, I heard rumors that Snoke is coming coming back. The Snoke, yes, yeah. Now, I, what really? Well, they're saying that though, Jason. They brought Darth Maul back, didn't they? Yeah, if Darth Maul could, you know, come back, then why couldn't Snoke? You know. Yeah, and they cut Darth Maul in off. <laughs> Yeah, well, same as Snook, so, you know, <laughs> put some robot legs on him and he's good to go. I'll keep this really short, but I, have, I, wasn't, I haven't been able to give my two cents about, you know, uh, uh, The Last Jedi. Please and do, please I, do. I, I personally really enjoyed the film. And the reason why is because I was surprised. Mm. And it, it, it wasn't a rehash of the same thing over and over again. And I was very surprised by many, many things. I was surprised by Luke, and I liked it. I was surprised to see Yoda, and I loved it. I was surprised to see Snook's character be taken down so quickly. And I I like being surprised. I don't like going into a Star Wars film or show and, you know, knowing what's going to happen, you know, yeah. or all the surprises. You know, and granted, there are things that I didn't like, but... It's still Star Wars, and I'm still gonna love it. Mm. And uh, you know, anytime I get a chance to see you know blasters firing and lightsabers going and 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 ships uh, flying and shooting and Tie fighters and stormtroopers, yeah. I'm gonna like it. So I'm not a purist, mm. and I I enjoy everything that they're bringing out. And I might not like a few things, like Canto Bite was a little. You know, there's a few things I didn't care for, it, but I did really enjoy seeing all the different species of people and creatures. And, and uh, you know, there's some things I didn't like about every Star Wars movie. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just want to put that out there that, you know, I love Star Wars and I, I love The Last Jedi. Please don't do any negative tweets towards Jason. His views are his own. <laughs> Hey, I said there are some things I didn't like, okay? But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hone in on that. I don't like the hate. I hate the hate. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, you know, yeah. I, I um, want the love. Yeah, so. I, I'm with you on that one. Now, I personally, Jason, you're probably, you're probably a bit. I did not like the Last Jedi, <laughs> but it's still a Star Wars film. There are some bits in it that I really did enjoy. Yeah. But there were certain choices with key characters that I thought that uh, Ry Johnson just thought, nah, I can't be bothered with that storyline. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I could say the same thing. You know, there's lots of things I wish I could have seen or things I wish would have not had happened. Uh, but I was surprised with a lot of this stuff, too. Mm. Oh, and, I, and oh I like gosh, yeah. Surprised. But there was, uh, but what they did with Luke, I was, I did not like. I did like the bit with Yoda. Absolutely loved that. But what they did with Luke's character, I thought, no way. And like, um, even Mark Hamill didn't like what they did with his character. Well, he had a problem with it, but he got over it. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think. But um, he also yeah. says <laughs> he, he certainly makes himself known about it, doesn't he? Right, right. right. But um, oh, it is what it is. It's it's now there to be viewed. I've got the DVD, you know, I've got the Blu-ray, I've got the 3D Blu-ray, uh, but I'll tell you what, Jason, I enjoyed Solo more. Have you seen Solo? Oh yeah, many times. And I've seen it digital too, I, I, we've watched it a few times already on digital, and all the extras, it's yeah. great. Yeah, I've got it on digital, I'm just, uh, I wanted to get myself the steel book, but they were sold out, they're totally sold out, so hopefully they'll get some more in stock once the film is out. But um, absolutely fantastic film, I love that film. Didn't think I would, Jason, but I did loved it i loved it too i loved it too and i it came out on my son's birthday so i took him and 17 of his closest friends to go see it that 17. Oh, my god. <laughs> oh my god i've got a funny enough i'm taking my son uh to the cinema for his birthday with i think four of his mates <laughs> and i'm thinking oh my god this is gonna be quick this is gonna be a bit of a job but 17 god yeah there's 17 took a bus or what <laughs> oh my god no that's all right yeah. Um, also, <laughs> let's get back to the news. 
Right, um, I saw online that uh, the Marvel Comics have released some artwork for an, for an all new Star Wars series. I don't know if you've seen this bit of artwork, Jason. Apparently, they announced it at the San Diego Comic Con and it's going to be doing a, a 30 issue maxi series under three different titles, with each exploring mm. a different era in a galaxy far, far away. Right, so you've got Age of the Re- Republic. Age of the Rebellion and Age of the Resistance. I quite like that how they've segregated them. You know what I mean? They've they've put them mm-hmm. into the little yeah. into the little categories, and it sounds really really good. Now the breakdowns of these comics in the Age of the Republic. I take it these are going to be individual stories based on these characters. But the Age of Republic, you're going to have uh, Qui Gon Jinn, Darth Maul, Obi Wan Kenobi, Jango Vett. Anakin Skywalker, Count Dooku, Padme Amidala, and General Grievous. Um, I think that's going to be eight comics, so that'd be eight stories. And then you've got the Age of the Rebellion. So you've got Lando Calrissian, Jabba the Hutt, Han Solo, Boba Fett, Luke Skywalker, Grand Moff Tarkin, Princess Leia, and Darth Vader. So you've got mm-hmm. them. And then you've got the Age of the Resistance, which is Poe Demerin, uh, Supreme Leader Snoke, Finn, Captain Phasma, Rose Tico. Uh, General Hooks, Ray, and Kylo Ren. And apparently, these are going to be going on for four months, eight issues each month, uh, and it's going to be a hero and a villain story. And it's going to kick off this December, and it's slated all the way till November 2019 uh, on the build-up for Star Wars Episode Nine. Look at that! <laughs> yeah, that's going to be fun. Yeah, it will be fun. Now, I just did a bit of googling Star Wars news, and there wasn't any. Not at all. There's, yeah, not a lot of news this week. Can yeah, you're right. There isn't any. So, what I'm going to ask you, Jason, is that um, if you go to Star Wars Celebrations, will you be taking any new prints? I, I do. I do. And actually, I designed a print back in January that I loved so much. And I showed it to uh, some friends and family. And I think I, I, think I, I teased you uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, I think you did through a text message or something, yeah. and uh, everyone said that's my ticket to celebration. So I held on to it, and I didn't, uh, you know, give it to Acme for a licensed print like I normally would. I held on to it, and you know, been playing with it ever since. And uh, for Star Wars Celebration, for the artists for Star Wars Celebrations, the the first round is done. So everyone's been vetted who can submit. Yeah, and so we now have until November second to submit our art for the Star Wars Celebration um, art show. Uh, so uh, mine's ready. You know, it, it'll be almost a year by the time the deadline comes since I've had it, uh, and I'm I'm super excited about it. I, you know, I I can't say a hundred percent for sure that this is my ticket into the show, but I I'm, I'm praying every day that it is. So. That's very, very cool. Right, now what we'll do is we'll head over to the Cargo Hold and have our interview with Matt Fox. Now, Matt Fox owns a massive collection um, which is on display at the New Walk Museum in Leicester. And soon he'll be also having his display at the Albert Hall. And you will hear the details of of that um, in the interview. So let's head over there and listen to me talk to Matt. Okay, Jason? Let's do it. Let's go. Matt, how are you doing, mate? I'm doing very well, Jamie. How are you? Not too bad. Now, collecting. It was one of my favourite things, and especially with the original figures. Going around the exhibition, it took me back to when I was a kid into that first yeah. Christmas when I opened up my little Christmas sack that was on the end of my bed and <laughs> slowly pulled out a figure and the moonlight were coming in and it was a C-3PO. I was like, ah, oh my God. That was way back when. That's the start of my collecting uh, of Star Wars figures. How was it for you? How did you How did oh, you? I actually get into it? remember my very first figure, Jamie, was a Darth Vader. That was the first. I, I, I don't know why I gravitated towards uh, towards the baddie, but um, the figure was amazing. Um, I remember it was from a little toy shop, Banstead High Street. Um, I drove past there actually uh, a few weeks ago, and sadly the toy shop's no longer there. But it was just uh, I, I can picture it now. You know, I can picture how the how the shop was laid out, and uh, I was only six years old. Um, but I yeah. got the uh, the Palatoy Darth Vader figure, sat on the back of Mum's car, uh, back seat, opened it up, and the smell. That's what I 
that's what I have a really strong memory of. And I think a, a lot of vintage collectors seem to remember the smell. For some reason, that sticks in there because it's a real vinyl rich plastic smell. Um, I, yeah. I suspect if you were to uh, open a carded figure now, which would be, of course, a very foolish and, um, and wasteful thing to do. But if you were, I doubt the smell has quite retained itself. But at the time, the smell was really powerful. And I, I remember... Uh, you know that Darth Vader figure um, that set me off really, and all I ever wanted for uh, for birthdays and Christmases back in '78 through to about you know Return of the Jedi time around '83 '84. Mm. All I really wanted was that was Star Wars toys for Christmases, birthdays, and um, I kind of built up. Uh, I guess uh, I built up my collection through through those years then, and on the back of the card, um, if you flip the card round on the back, there was a little command at the back. It said, "Collect them all," uh, and then there was a mm. picture of all the figures in the toy line. And um, I'm still trying to obey that simple command to this day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I, I feel your pain, Matt, on that one. Now, now, when you say about that smell, that vinyl mm. smell, you're dead right. All my original figures, I've packed in a, a very dark box. But the way I've packed them is I packed them in plastic bubble wrap because they're in like a container. Every now and again, when I'm going through my garage and I, and I pull out a box, I sit there and have a look through. If I unwrap it, they've got back that <laughs> vinyl smell. All right, and it like way, it's like a proper time machine takes me straight back and i just want to even though yeah i'm in my 40s i want to get them out and start having a right good play yeah. with them well, on the subject I mean? smells, there was yeah. one in particular it was the the tie fighter pilot which was a fantastic empire strikes back figure in the vintage line it was you know al- almost jet black and um mm. that figure smelled of strawberries and it was bizarre i mean really strong pungent strawberry smell and i got to meet bob brecken the palatoy chief designer um, when the exhibition opened quite recently and uh, I mentioned this to Bob and he said oh that's because of strawberry shortcake and I said what he said well Palatoy also made the strawberry shortcake toy line and uh, they were all scented strawberry and um, for some reason that, pati- that particular figure was infused mm-hmm. with the strawberry shortcake uh, smell is in the obviously being being sort of put together in the same part <laughs> of the factory or whatever and uh, he, he, he told yeah. me that the TIE fighter pilot smells of strawberry uh, because of strawberry shortcake. Amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's, do you know, I could, now you've just mentioned it, you know, because I've got that figure, and I always thought it smelt like strawberry, <laughs> but I just thought it was my imagination. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I thought, that is a bit strange. Do you know, Palatoy, whenever you see figures and they've got the Kenner in the corner, I so much prefer the, the Palatoy logo than the Kenner. Mm. I think the Palatoy logo, especially for the vintage, collector's cards i think even though kenner um are doing these vintage cards i wish they would put the palatoy on i don't know why i just wish they put the palatoy yeah, i agree on isn't it? it's red white red white and blue it's really distinctive um it, it, mm. it's, a, it's a lovely nostalgic um logo and they they sadly they sort of dropped yeah. it for for the later toys in the line so um star wars and, and empire strikes back uh carded figures had the had the logo on the front but when they got to Return yeah. of the jedi they they sort of dropped it because they wanted to be able to um release the same figure across all the European territory mm. without having to yeah. make a unique packaging for France and for Spain and for uh, for, for England yeah. and whatnot. So um so the logo went sadly, but um yeah you, you can you can pay a hefty premium for that logo over over the Kenner. It's worth worth a fair yeah. bit more. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, if I remember rightly, because you're about you're about the same age as me, you saw Star Wars at uh, the Odeon Cinema. No, I didn't. No, I am. No, you didn't. No, I grew up in Surrey, and I I, I saw Star Wars at my local cinema in Sutton, actually. And uh, it was the very first film I ever went to see at the cinema, so um, it 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 made a really big impression because you know not only being the you know the first time going into a cinema and being in that environment Mm. with the dark room and the big screen. But uh, to see that particular yeah. film, it, it was a, uh, it was pretty powerful, and it started off a big, you know, lifelong passion for cinemas. And uh, I've always, uh, I've always enjoyed cinemas. And um, I, I actually got a job for a while as a cinema manager. And after I finished university, I worked for for a while as a as a cinema manager. And um, you know, I really enjoyed that experience. And um, so yeah, I, I collect as well as toys. I collect cinema related memorabilia for Star Wars. And um, you know, mostly the uh, the, the movie posters. Funny enough, I got a job in a cinema. I got a job in the Odeon Cinema when they rebuilt it in Leicester. Oh, really? Just so I could, yeah, just so I could get the posters <laughs> and, and the merchandise that come through. But when I went to see Star Wars, Matt, in, um, in Leicester, uh, at the Odeon, that's when I first saw the Star Wars toys because 
they had the initial launch of the uh, of the the Falcon and the X Wing. I think the Tie Fighter was there, but they had all the figures, but they were hanging from the ceiling. And wow. I was and I remember as I was going in because um, we my mum queued in the rain. Uh, for hours before we got in and I remember looking at the toys and I was like wow but um, the, the, how I got into collector apart from my mum buying me of course is that uh, my mum bless her she worked at uh, the local bingo and um, one of the patrons that came down to play bingo on regular nights it was this woman who she worked at Palatoy uh-huh. so she would come down and say to my mum Pauline, uh, I've got some uh, space toys in my boot in my car. Do you want to draw and have a look, see if you want to buy any? And my mum was like, yeah, I might have a look. So she had a look and she saw they were, they were all Star Wars toys. So she bought the lot. And then, of course, every time this, this lady came, she just kept bit, getting bits and bits and bits. And that's how I got all my collection. The only thing that she couldn't fit in her boot, believe it or not, was the Atta. <laughs> she couldn't fit it. Right, and I got I got the B wing, I've got the uh, the Rebel transporter, I've got the Y wing, but she could not get the attack. So I never got an attack until about a year ago, believe it or not. Where That's are those toys go- now, Jamie? Did you, did you kind of keep them right through childhood, or did they get sold off at some point? I've got them all. I've still got them all. Um, there is a couple of pieces. Which, as I've grown up, they my, I did have a. <laughs> I loved my brother, but he got a bit spiteful in uh, in when we were kids. But kids being kids, you know what I mean. And he, um, he, well, I don't like bringing it up, but he kind of destroyed my Death Star, <laughs> right? And I had that. Do you know what's in the foyer of your exhibition? Yeah. Is the Palatoy Death Star, and I absolutely loved that playset. That is my favourite playset. Yeah of any time of any toys and um, played with it for an awful long time and then one day my brother came in with his mates and kicked it across the floor and <laughs> it smashed no. and um, and yeah and since then I've always been trying to, I've always been on the lookout for it and two other ones that uh, have gone in the uh, in the I don't know where they've gone in the past but I had the canteen mm-hmm. the cantina yeah. And I had the Jawa playset with the cardboard um, sand crawler. Yeah, fantastic. Which I saw both of them at your exhibition. Um, they were the only two bits I've not got, but the rest of it I have still got. And the I've got a, a shuttle Tidarian that was in a box, sat in a, a window um, of, a, of a shop for three years. And every couple of months I would walk in and say, you're going to sell that, you're going to sell that. And I was trying to get the guy down from 90 quid. And in the end, he sold it to me for £10 because it was sun bleach. No, the box. <laughs> yeah. Sun bleach, no one to buy it. says, I'll oh, take it. And I'm like, thank you very much. So that's, you, yes, well, I've for, still got for, that in my collection. £10 for, even for a sun bleach box on that one. That's, that's a real score. <laughs> mm, yeah, I've had that for quite some time now because I was quite young with that. With my collection, I've got like um, two Y-Wings, a B-Wing. Uh, the Falcon. I've got. I love the Falcon. I love the design of that. Um, and the the well, the B wing. That when I got that as a toy, I thought that that was absolutely fantastically built. It was just like, oh, do you remember the old dive bomber uh, on the fairs? It reminded yeah. me of that. You know, with yeah. the cockpit. But yeah. how it for back in the day, how that worked. Well, you're right. It, it, it did. We used to get the um the, the fair came round uh, to to our way. I lived, lived near Epsom, and where we had the derby, we always got the fair each year. And there, they had the dive bomber. Mm. And you're right. And the the dive bomber rotates the actual uh, part mm. you're sitting in. Yeah, rotates, it did. Just like the B wing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, that's I used I, every I, time. I've never I've never seen that before. But I don't think I'll be able to look at it the same way again now, Jamie. After you've said that. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's yeah. your what was your favourite um, of your set? Because you've you've got quite um, a big my set. favourite. Uh, what was the same as you? It was the Palatoy Death Star. The year is nineteen seventy eight, and Palatoy brings you Star Wars. Here on Death Star, Ben Kenobi combats the awesome power of Darth Vader, while Han and Tia battle for their lives in the trash compactor. Luke evades the stormtroopers with R2, D2, and C3PO, but can he escape from the X-Wing fighter? Only you will know. Only you can create your own Star Wars. Death Star, vehicles, figures, all sold separately. May the Force be with you. Um, it just had a huge amount of play value. Um, the, 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 the toy 
for the listeners that don't know, it's a cardboard dome, essentially. Um, and like a doll's house, it's got sort of various uh, rooms and chambers. And um, there's, a, there's a trash compactor and uh, you can push figures down the little chute to get into the trash compactor. Um, up on the top of it, there's a gunnery cockpit. Um, so you can put a gunner in there and there's a couple of lasers, uh, same as the X-Wing uh, laser blasters on the, on the edges there. Um, and, and there's various doors and sort of areas that you can uh, fill up with um, stormtroopers and uh, Imperial commanders. Um, it's, it's a brilliant place set. But um, I, I have to admit, I, I've just got a love for all the, the vintage Star Wars toys. I mm. don't think that, I mean, there's, there's a couple that are perhaps a little bit on the lesser side, um, a little bit less iconic. And um, I, I've never been to a museum yet where I can actually fit all of them in. Um, so I always yeah. have to be selective. So um, I try and select the more iconic ones, Millennium Falcons, the X-Wings, the TIE Fighters, um, the more recognisable ones, whereas um, some of maybe the toys that are a little bit less recognisable, uh, such as maybe the Rebel Transport, uh, that big sort of mm. thing shaped a bit like a tuna, uh, that's yep. not that's not in there. Um, that that didn't quite make the cut. But um, I, I try and get the the ones that sort of the most of the general public uh, will recognise. Yeah, there was one toy there that I, I stood looking at it for a long time, and that was that twin cockpit X-wing. Yes. Now I did hear. Back in the day, that um, that Palatoy wanted to extend the life, you know, to extend the the toy range, but it was um, not Lucas approved or whatever. But I'd never seen one, so that was the first time I seen that one. It was yes, really so it was um, it, it was Kenner actually that had the um, the notion to uh, continue the toy line, and um, they created a uh, sort of a, a binder presentation with several different ideas in, and they took the ideas to um, to Lucasfilm. And one of them was going to be a TIE bomber. There was this tandem X-Wing, as they called it, which was black rather than the uh, the classic white X-Wing. And um, interesting to see that Poe Dameron uh, flew a black X-Wing. I was going to say that, yeah. It looks and, very uh, much was, like there it. Was a, there was a, a planned playset, which is called the Imperial Outpost, which would have been the largest playset in the toy line if they'd have made it. But um, ultimately, uh, the decision was taken, uh, probably wisely, that the, um, the the line had run out of steam and uh, it was time to mm. call it a day because r- really what what happened at the end of the toy line was was quite sad it was um it was a fire sale in in you know in, in the truest sense uh Woolworths was selling f- figures off eight in a bag for 99p um you know everything was going into the bargain but the yeah. shelves were being cleared for the new stuff that was interesting kids which was he-man and transformers in particular were coming in big um in the mid 80s and Without a new movie on the horizon, um, you know, let's, let's, this was two or three years after Return of the Jedi had done its cinema run. Um, you know, the, the, the toys just couldn't sell anymore. It's amazing to think that now, isn't it? That they, they it, couldn't it is, get rid and, of them. Um, they didn't actually, um, they didn't sort of disappear too long. Once they were no longer available at retail, it wasn't really a huge amount of time before sort of the aftermarket began. And, um, you started seeing uh, Star Wars figures at uh, sort of collector fairs and um, being sold uh, second hand. And, you know, people remember sort of seeing them, you know, even in the late 80s, you know, around 89, they were sort of selling them as sort of specialist things at collector fairs. And then, um, you know, around the mid 90s, we got eBay, obviously, that that and the Internet came came about. And, uh, and then it really sort of took off from there. And um, you'll, you'll probably uh, know that there's been a big bump in value since Disney acquired Lucasfilm and uh We've obviously yeah. had the, the, the announcements for the new films came up that created a big resurgence. And then when The Force Awakens came out and was a, you know, a huge blockbuster and, um, you know, broke records as the original Star Wars movie had, um, you mm-hmm. know, suddenly values and interest were, were, were through the roof. Yeah, yeah. Saying that about the, the toys that come out now to back then, I'm not too keen on the new ones. Perhaps it's the price price of each figure. You get you three and three quarter. And you can pay up to 20 quid for that figure. And I've always thought, how, you know, especially without, there's a lot to say that uh, these figures stay on the pegs or, or there's not enough of them. So they give you that false sense that they are flying off the pegs. But when you're a kid and you want an action figure and you've got to pay 20 pounds for that three and three quarters, it's going to put you off. You can only buy one or two where if they down priced them, you know, to like, I don't know, six or seven pounds. Kids are going to buy them. I think they they pretty much outpriced themselves. What do you? What do you I um, on that I sort of made made a rule for myself that I'm I'm going to sort of set 
parameters for my collecting because there's a lot of Star Wars merchandise out there. I mean, I could have filled up the whole of New York Museum, not just one of the galleries there, uh, if, <laughs> if I wanted to. Um, so yeah. Early on, I kind of made, made myself, you know, say that it's just going to be vintage era. So I, I collect within the 1977 to 1985 um, toy line. And yeah. every now and then I do see a toy and I think, oh, blimey, that, that's that's quite a nice sculpture on that one. Or, um, you know, I'd, I'd quite like a First Order Trooper, um, you know, or Kylo Ren. That's a, that's a great design. Yeah. Um, but I, I sort of stopped myself. So um, I had to say, I don't know too much about the uh, the modern toy line. So I, I kind of, you know, every now and then I, I'll have a little sneaky peek um, and see what's going on. But um, I haven't collected any of them. I, 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 I've had to be strong, be firm with myself because yeah. it's, it's a slippery slope otherwise. And I've got this uh, completest kind of mindset and um, I'd probably try and get all of them if I started just getting one. <laughs> Yeah, I know what you mean. Only uh, yesterday I walked into Home Bargains, a good place to pick up some cheap stuff, and I picked up two Black Series figures. Uh, they're not, I think they're the six inch ones of Chirrut and Bays from Rogue right. One. And um, they're pretty good sculpts, I must admit, but these usually retail at about mm-hmm. 20 pounds each. And I picked them up for a fiver each, and I thought that was in my yeah. my uh, limit. But yeah, when it comes to figures, the uh, the look of the originals, fantastic. You got the figure, you got the gun. You don't need no fancy gimmicks <laughs> that uh, the newer range brought out. You know, like backpacks and stuff. What what's going on with that? After no, just figure yes. and no, a gun. They're, they were pretty. Um, they were pretty simple. They you know just five points of articulation, just the uh, the arms, the legs, and the uh, and the head. Yeah. And, Actually, for some figures like Chewbacca, uh, the head didn't even turn, um, so it's been four, right, four points yeah. of articulation. But um, they were very robust. The vintage figures, I have to say, um, you know, I, I, I still sort of buy up job lots, and uh, you can tell these figures have been heavily played with. But they, they rarely break. Um, you know, they, mm. they can be chipped, and they can have all the paint gone off them. But um, you know, they're, they're they're still in one piece. So um, they they were really robust, strong figures. Yeah, what was um? You know when they brought out the figures that the Luke and the Han were like proper beefcakes. Yes. What did you reckon to that line? Uh, that wasn't a particularly good line for yeah. me. I didn't like it. It was more like <laughs> that He-Man. was. It was the Power of the Force two line, which I think was early nineties. I, I I could be wrong, but I know it was a. Uh, there was a bit of a gap between the vintage line and then that that was the next one brought out. And I, I guess it was perhaps a reaction to He Man, but um. Yeah, it it was kind of ludicrous now when you, when you sort of look at, look at the uh, how, how how muscular it's definitely Luke has definitely been pushing some iron there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now, um, also in your collection, you got these um, Star Wars figures of um, from around the world. How did you get hold of? I've always been really figures? interested, actually, in the global aspect of the hobby and um, the fact that the uh, Star Wars toys were produced in so many different countries um, often resulted in. Um, some sort of minor differences and uh, changes between the packaging and also changes actually in the figures. So um, you, you yeah. get a, a, a lot of variant figures. So um, the, the the figure for um, Bib Fortuna is, 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 a, is a great example. The, uh, a Bib Fortuna figure is a, is a fairly sort of common uh, regular figure if you bought it in England or if you bought it in, um, in, in America. But um, if you go mm-hmm. to Mexico, the Mexican version of the Bib Fortuna figure uh, is was made by a company called Lily Leddy. Nuevas emociones te esperan con la colección El Regreso del Jedi. ¿Qué pasa? Todo está bien. Tengo un prisionero muy valioso. Diviértete con los personajes del Regreso del Jedi. Llévame a Endor, piloto. No te engordenes. Ya tiene. Princesa Lea. Obedece o haré estallar esta bomba. Vamos. Chewbacca y nuevos personajes del Regreso del Jedi. ¿Quién está pensando en ti? Um, and you can never say Lily Leddy too many times. Great, <laughs> a great couple of words. Um, but the Lily Leddy version, Lady, 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 Lady. <laughs> they made it with with a burgundy, a lovely sort of red wine coloured cloak. Um, so um, yeah. it, it made it quite distinguished from the um, from the regular figure. And actually, um, that figure there with with the burgundy cloak is, is about a thousand pounds, whereas a regular one yeah. is maybe ten, twelve pounds. So um, it can make a big difference. Um, and, and, and I was fascinated by the differences, and um, I. I've, try to sort of highlight that in the exhibition by having um, figures paired up so you can uh, sort of play a game and spot the difference. There was um, a, a Jawa and it said it was made That's by right, Meccano. yeah, Meccano had the licence in France, so um, 
we had Palato in the UK. In, in, in France, it was Meccano, who uh, we probably know better as making, um, you know, these sort of construction kits with nuts and bolts and, uh, yeah. and whatnot. But yes, Meccano, the toy producer, made them. Um, uh, they, they, they had the license in, in France. It's amazing how different toy companies managed to get the same, well, get the license and uh, produce the figures. Do you think the, the f- when they were sold abroad, they were the same figures from Palatoy just shipped across? Most and of the figures were um, produced in in the Far East, in Hong Kong, and oh. in Taiwan, and um, of course, uh, <laughs> the, the there way. was some packaging that went on. Um, in different countries so there it, it was it was pretty elaborate and it would it would probably take a whole podcast to explain how how it, how it was all done and i don't even think yeah. i'd have the knowledge to explain how, how it was all done because it was such a huge global operation um i i know we also had shortages they couldn't meet demand and um palatoy had to um you know kind of ju- just sort of keep certain toy shops sweet and other toy shops Sadly, you know, they, they didn't get the stock they wanted. Um, so there, there, yeah. was, there was a huge demand. And um, you know, part of that is what led to them being very bullish um, towards the end and actually having too much stock left at the end of the line as well. That's amazing, that is. Also, I was looking at, um, at your display and I was amazed that you still had a um, the piece of paper for the bounty hunting where you would uh, cut out the, the figures' names attach them to the piece of paper and send it off and you usually get uh, something in return now i i was a keen collector of them myself you know i was cut, constantly cutting them out yeah. and um i wouldn't dare do that now <laughs> <laughs> thinking about dare take that pair of scissors to it but um i got Chewbacca's oh, yeah. belt the bandolier yeah, which uh, <laughs> the bandolier that's it i got that but um i recently dug it out of my box and the the foam is right in away <laughs> it's yeah. crumbled um but i've i've actually been online and you can get a replacement <laughs> foam for that yeah believe it or not um so um i've got that i got the emperor i've got the emperor figure i sent away for the boba fett with the firing rocket pack yeah and um and some uh, like a survival do you remember they brought out like a survival pack yeah. for hoff and you had gas masks and stuff like that. i got all them I constantly, well, I constantly sent away, and I think I got, I did them, I did them all, I got them all. But the one thing that never turned up, of course, was the uh, Boba Fett with a rocket firing <laughs> backpack. That's right. That was good. From the Star Wars collection comes the Stormtrooper, the Sand People, and all twenty action figures, including new Hammerhead, Snaggletooth, and more, each sold separately. And now Boba Fett, Star Wars villain, with his laser rifle. Boba Fett is not yet available in stores, but you can get him free with four proofs of purchase from any Star Wars action figures. Details on specially marked packs at participating stores. Offer ends May 31st. Star Wars action figures sold separately from Kenner. Now, that one that you've got in your um, exhibition, is that the actual... That's not one that no, actually no, buys, well, is it? J- just going back to the um, t- to that offer, that was something that Palatoy had, had good success with for Action Man, actually. Um, Palatoy made Action Man prior to Star Wars, and um, they, they had sort of little... I think it was stars that you could cut off the pack, and, um, you know, the, the big box items had more stars, and the, and the small items had less stars, but you could send those in, and you could get sort of a mail-away thing. So... Um, they had the idea to sort of repeat that with Star Wars with these um, bounty hunter tokens. So you could sort of cut off these little bounty hunter tokens or cut off the uh, the nameplates out of the carded figures and send off for things. And um, the one I've got in the exhibition is actually one of the few things that's not mine. Um, it's it's, it's, oh, a, it's okay. another collector called um, uh, Andy Norton who really kindly loaned that to me. Um, I just thought it was fantastic. It's been filled in, but it was never sent. Uh, but he's got the nameplates on there on this thing ready to go. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was the same at the time, Jamie. I, I did it too. And I remember um, waiting for what seemed like months and months and months for it to, uh, you know, every, every every time the postman arrived, you kind of check in the door. Um, they took a long time to send those things out. It, it wasn't like you're going to get it within 21 days. It was a lot longer than that. But uh, It was a long time. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, I remember. and when it came to Boba Fett, they, um, they, they of course, famously cancelled the rocket firing mechanism um, because of uh, worries that it would... Uh, it would be a danger and you're going to have have a kid's eye out with that rocket so um they they, they cancelled the rocket fire mechanism and um boba fett just has a fixed embedded rocket in his backpack that doesn't come out but um i mean i know i was gutted if you actually had a boxed one of those and it's still in the mailer box from palatoy then uh, then again that's a thousand pound item it's um you know, very 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 few of them have survived because 
the, the mailer boxes were plain white. They were pretty um, nondescript, pretty ugly. So they would have just gone in the bin, and um, no one, no one really thought to keep them. So that there's very, very few of those who have uh, survived the years. Yeah. All oh, right. Now, I did go to a, a convention it was last year. They were selling. The, I thought the cheek of it. They were selling um, Bubba Fett's in these like vintage little boxes, white boxes. And it was the rocket firing one. And and I said, uh, how much for that? And he went, I want £50 for that, mate. And I says, £50? And he went, yeah, that's uh, an original one. With I says, I says, give me a brain, mate. If this was an original, you wouldn't be charging me £50. Mm-hmm. I said, so I had a look at it, and the plastic was really bendy, horrible thing. And I was thinking, £50, man. I wouldn't even give you £5 for it. <laughs> it's pr- but people were buying them, and I was thinking, "You're idiots," you know what I mean? Because it's it's just a knockoff, you know what I mean? Of that, just a knockoff. Yeah, there, I mean, there, there are there are genuine ones that exist, but they um they they are pre-production. Um, the rocket firing ones mm. were never sold at retail, but um they did create a, quite a few mock-ups at Kenner. I think uh, yeah, I think uh, I could be wrong, but I think there's approximately around a hundred. That, are, that exist and they were all sort of pre-production really ones um but they they, ch- they change hands for um for proper money you know it's um yeah um i could have sworn i seen one on um on on one of the channels that's right Toy yeah. Hunter, and um he had one and he sold it for quite a lot of money now i've got a clip the audio is not that good but uh, let's just see how much he did so sell it. The for. forces with me. How, how, much? Much? how, how much? much? How much? How much? How much? Are you ready? Twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, I couldn't buy that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Comic Con is coming to an end. All right. I got, I got something. This guy is a serious collector. Time to pull out the wow factor. It's the unproduced. Boba Fett action figure, often spoken about but very rarely seen. Sick. I've never seen one in person before. So, how much? The price on the Rocket Fett is $20,000. <laughs> As an individual piece, I think it's the only piece I don't have. Would you take 15 I can't do 15 A little too low for me. 17000 My girlfriend's gonna kill me. <laughs> like, kill me, like for real. Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> Thanks, man. 17,000? Jesus. That's a lot of money. His wife will kill him. <laughs> yeah, so the the, um, the ones that are being sold now, they're, uh, they're kind of reproductions. So um, I, I don't feel too bad about those particular reproductions because they're not a... They're, they're not going to fool anyone because they, they it was a toy that was never made. But um, the reproductions that I that I don't like um, that that are a real problem is, is when you have reproductions of uh, of the weapons, and and they and they look very close to the real thing, and um, they they do often fool collectors. So uh, they're fairly um, immoral and un- unethical. So I don't I'm not a fan at all of the reproduction weapon. Mm. I've got all my weapons in one big Star Wars right. tin. Now I think I would have to go back into a cat into uh, some kind of collector's guide to see which weapon went with which figure. Now back in the day, you know what I mean? Because I just put them all out for <laughs> safekeeping. I put them all in one in one little tin. Uh, I hope no one robs me. So <laughs> 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 they'd be going away with my full, with that my life. Would be the thing to go for, you know, because the, the weapons are oftentimes more valuable than natural figures themselves. Um, because obviously oh, they were they were so easy to lose. They're so small. So um, the, the, the 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 a loose a loose figure is um is really nothing without his weapon. It's the weapon that really gives it the value. Yeah. Now, um, another figure that um, I often see that's worth a lot is the uh, is the Snaggletooth figure. And if I remember rightly, didn't they originally they brought him out with uh, was it longer legs, longer legs? Because in the the Kenner didn't or Palatoy didn't know how how tall he was. That's right. And it was only into, and now it was only until later when they got a proper figure, then they re they relaunched it and how. Now, one of them uh, is it the one with the longer legs? Is worth a lot of money. It is, yeah. There's 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 a blue version, which is sort of a full height version, and and then there's a, there's mm. a sort of a, a red version, which is far shorter. And it's the um the blue version is is the, uh, the the first one that soon got discontinued because, as you say, they were they were working from a a, a photo that um, didn't really show the show the character properly. So um they created a, they created a full length version where he's meant to be a little a little short chap. So um. The, yeah. the, the blue version was only available within the uh, the Sears Cantina. It was an American uh, 
uh, play set that um, you, you got four cantina aliens in and uh, the blue snaggletooth was one of those four so that's a nice rare figure and again a, 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 a good a good valuable figure as well if you do manage to luck into one um, unfortunately I didn't get it that was one I didn't get there was um, another thing as well about the different colours sometimes uh, you get figures that have got a, a different uh, coloured vest or um, or hair and stuff like that, or, or the face. Now, if I remember rightly, I've got a couple of Admiral Akbar's. They're all different coloured. And I used to use them as... One was like Admiral Akbar, and then he had his little guys that were walking around the bridge. Uh, I used them as them. Now, um, you did have something like that in your exhibition, haven't you, about the different yeah. colours as quick well? quick shout-out to Admiral Akbar. Uh, I think The Last Jedi should have had Admiral Akbar instead of Admiral Holdo. I think that that was a flaw. Admiral Akbar doing that suicide run at the end of, um, uh, or partway through Last Jedi, that would have been a lot more powerful for me. Uh, Absolutely. Do you agree? Fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. I only had this conversation with Paul Bateman <laughs> that you have to bring in this fresh character when you've got one right there with a powerful heritage yeah. that could do the job and it would be more more of a, an emotional punch. It would, and, uh, and, and actually, retrospectively, you'd go back and you'd watch the Return of the Jedi, and when you see Akbar in that, you you would have, or yeah. you'd know his ultimate fate, and I think that would have made him even more liked in Return of the Jedi as well. So, um, I, yeah, I think Not just that, be blasted out of an airlock. That would, and that'd be yeah, it. Yeah, it would, it, and you never even saw, you know, you never even saw him, saw him trying to cling on to a light control pad or fight for life or anything it was just gone exactly yeah. it was so quick it, it was it was a i very, didn't even know we were a, gone a, a very strange finish but anyway go, going back to your to your question yes they did make akbar um in a couple of different colors his bib came in sort of an olive, olive cover and a tan color and um that was the same with a lot of the figures um there, there are variations and and there's different hair colors and um sometimes it can be a a, a big difference in value um for example, Luke Farmboy. If you can find a Luke Farmboy figure um, with orange hair, um, the gingerhead Luke Farmboy, um, very, very, very good find. You know, you, you've got something worth hundreds there. Um, I think I've, I think I've got. <laughs> oh, two well, have a look. Versions of them. <laughs> but, I'll, no, I'll have to have a look. But, um, but, but at other times, and there doesn't seem to be any particular rhyme or reason why um, why, why the colours changed. But um, it was probably mm. just. Um, something that was done with different paint batches or they came out of different factories because they were produced um, although they came from the Far East they, there were several different factories um, in Hong Kong and China uh, and in Taiwan yeah. were producing them Alright, that's really interesting Do you know, uh, I think at some point Matt, you're going to have to come up and have a look at my uh, collection and, and tell me exactly how much it's <laughs> worth <laughs> so I can retire or buy that DeLorean that I've been trying to save up for yeah. um, Now the other thing as well is, um, do you know with the the Jawas at the at, at, in the time? Originally, I thought I could because I've got one um, for the life of me. I'm sure he's got the uh, fabric cloak. Can't remember why they changed it. Was it because it was just not good enough? It began life with a vinyl cloak, and because the figure was so diminutive and small, it was felt that it didn't offer as much uh, value for money. Uh, you know, when you mm. sort of place it alongside a Chewbacca or a Princess Lear or whatnot. So um decided that they needed to make this figure a little bit extra special. And although Princess Lear yeah. and uh, and the Ben Kenobi also had the vinyl cloaks, because the size of the jar was so little, they thought we're going to make this one a bit special and we're going to give it the fabric cloak. And um that was really the thinking behind it, was to try and add uh, perceived value to the figure. And ah, by doing right, that, they've gotcha. actually, it's, ironically, they've added an awful lot of value to the vinyl cloak figure. And, then, and that's now worth in excess of a thousand pounds we have oh bloody hell bloody hell because i always thought once they brought that figure out i thought oh i wish they brought them out for the for the like um for the vader one and for the uh, princess leia and even ben kenobi yeah. i thought they would probably look nice <laughs> with a nice fabric they one would. and of course later on they did didn't they they brought them all out with, yes like, with, they um, did they sort of switched over and then and there's quite a few fabric uh, uh cloaked figures um in, in the later line yep yeah. Yeah. Now, um, also in the collection, I saw a couple of yeah. the mini rigs. Now, d did you manage to get I, all I of them? I have got all ones? the mini rigs. I haven't got them all on display, but um, yes, they they made um, they, they, they made a good few mini rigs. Now, I, I rather liked them at the time. They were they were cheap and they were yeah, inexpensive. I did as well. and, um, although most of them, in fact, I, I don't think any of them are actually in the film at all. Um, 
No, none of but, them. Um, <laughs> they, they felt like things that maybe they were just sort of off screen or they were just, uh, you know, uh, waiting to happen. Um, but, uh, you know, I thought, mm. they, I thought they were all rather good. In fact, um, one of the mini rigs, um, I could have sworn they took the design and um, sort of beefed it up a little bit for Rogue One as a, a tank. It had this similar shape of, um, I'm trying to think which one it is. It's like a wedge with um, the back of it swings down for it to sit down sort of thing. It's like a like Okay, I think maybe the, the brownish one is the AST-5. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good job you know, because <laughs> I could tell you which, what, what, the name of oh, it. They're, they're, I can remember them, but I can't remember them. They're names. all numbered, but none of the, they weren't released in order, strange enough. You've got, uh, there's one called Cap-2, there's MOC-3, there's INT-4, um, AST-5. Um, so they, they, they're all numbered. They, they weren't actually released in the order they were numbered in, which is a, a bit odd. But um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, the the new films actually have got loads of fantastic um, designs that hark back um, previously. I mean, I, I was shown a Ralph McQuarrie sketch of um, something very very similar to BB-8, and uh, this sketch mm. was done in 1976 for the for the first movie. So um, oh, yeah. who, whoever was um, was charged with um, you know putting together design work for for Rogue One and for Force Awakens and last jedi they certainly uh, have sort of gone through the archives and they found things that were star warsy and um perhaps designs that uh, that weren't used and um we've already mentioned the, the black x-wing that uh kenner designed um that yeah. was very similar to, to poe dameron's and um maybe in one of the new films we will actually see a tandem x-wing with the uh, with the two seats that would be, be pretty fantastic it wouldn't surprise me yeah. Matt. it wouldn't surprise me also in the collection um i saw um a life-size darth vader mask now, you had a signature saying Darth Vader uh, next to it. Now, I remember getting the same bit of paper when I went down to the local uh, toy store in Leicester called Domino's. Right. And um, I remember it being advertised in the Leicester Mercury. My mum goes, Darth Vader's going to be making an appearance. Do you want to go? And I was like, yeah. So I went down and he was there and he, and he signed it, Darth Vader. And I was like, my god i've got his signature i was really over the moon <laughs> and then a couple of years later they did it again right so i went down and uh, i got his autograph again and me being me i had the original i put him side side i went hey they don't match up what's happening here <laughs> my brain was like this ain't the same guy what's happening then my mum went oh he can't see properly in it so it's bad just squiggling i was like oh, good thinking mum <laughs> well it was, yeah, and I've it still was got, around still about 1983 um the palatoy um sort of commissioned this promotional tour a uh, toy shop tour and uh mm. they they had multiple darth vaders and um they were going off to different uh, toy shops they tended to visit the uh, the larger toy shops in, in the bigger towns so uh, so leicester would have got one and um they the costumes mm. were pretty darn good actually um by all accounts uh, looking back through the archival oh, gotcha. photos they they were decent costumes and um you know most of the kids would probably have assumed that they were actually uh seeing um dave prowse himself um yeah you know absolutely. visiting there and um they, they would all sign the these these little slips so i've i've got a uh, one of these autograph slips in the exhibition lo- along with the helmet um to represent mm-hmm. that and some archival photos and um so, funnily enough actually just um just this evening the, the evening that we're recording before we uh, began our conversation i saw on facebook that um dave prowse is um his health is deteriorating he's no longer going to be doing any signings um uh, at all he was doing signings sort of private signings in his home um but he, he mm. he's he said now that um it's the end of the line for him in terms of uh doing signings so um it, it, that's that uh, a, a little a little sort of emotional moment there that we've had these uh these old autographs that uh, that were signed by darth vader and the, the real darth vader is now um uh, now no longer going to be doing it but Ooh, i tell you what you had me worried there though matt when you said that because i hadn't checked facebook i thought so going to say, is he died? I hope not. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, well he's worried. been a regular on the uh, the convention circuit for many years, and he's very, he's he's, he's definitely uh, beloved by us fans. And um, I do wish him all the well, and hope hope that he has a, you know, ha, 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 I know I know I his health well. isn't great, but uh, I hope he, hope he has a good long full proper retirement mm. now with his family. Yeah, I've met him three or four times at different conventions, and I always thought he got a bum deal with uh, Lucasfilm, Harry couldn't go to the proper celebrations because he would have had queues because people just died to see him at proper Star Wars convention instead of the smaller ones. I've got a couple of pieces, uh, Matt, signed by him. I've got a photo in that. And uh, one, I've got 
a, uh, a life-size Vader helmet, which he signed for me, and I've got me, one of my prized possessions is on my wall behind me, uh, which was um, a bit of artwork that uh, my niece bought me of Vader posting with a mailbag saying uh, a Royal Mail posting a letter into R2-D2 and I've actually got Dave Prowse signed that and I've got Kenny Baker the same thing. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that was and, 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 and you know, the Green Cross Code Man as well, where the right age to remember that, Jamie. You know, le- yeah, legend. I loved it. I've seen him, seen him in Leicester live <laughs> doing that. So, yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that one, Matt. Was, um, I hope he gets better soon. I really do. Um, now, do you know, going on to, there was, well, there was one thing I did see at um, your exhibition, and, and I had to turn around to my son and say, see, I wasn't making it up, and that was the Star Wars landfill. Now, I remember this <laughs> on, yeah. on uh, Central News, and I was horrified where you actually, because they had footage, Matt, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they had footage of the Star Wars Luke Skywalker is being chucked into one. I tell you what, Jamie, I've never seen that footage on Central News. I'd love, I'd love to, um, because it's been a persistent sort of rumor, like an urban legend for uh, for, for years that there's a hmm. there's this sort of treasure trove of buried Star Wars toys somewhere in Leicestershire, and um, yeah. you know if if it if it's if it's true, and uh, you know, and there's no reason to doubt it really. If it could be pinpointed and found. Um, that would be uh, that would be quite something special. And um, there was a recent um, documentary on BBC Four actually just about a week ago um, called "For the Love of Landfill," and um, it's probably available on iPlayer if your listeners still want to look out for it mm. on, on BBC iPlayer. "For the Love of Landfill," and um, and in that they actually excavated an '80s landfill, and um, yeah, it was remarkable how well everything was still preserved, um, buried underground, um, no no air, no sun bleaching. Um, everything was fairly crushed, so there was compression damage. But um, aside from that, everything was nothing had decomposed at all. You know, they they were pulling out clothes that you could wear today, and uh, it was fine. They even pulled out a newspaper, and um, yeah. the newspaper obviously on very very thin, poor quality paper, and um, this thing was fine. You could still read it; you could turn every page. Um, and if that has survived in that condition, then um, something like a you know a card back or or a Star Wars plastic toys boxes, um, they ought to still yeah. be in pretty decent shape. So um, if uh, if this landfill could be found, uh, that would be quite something. And I know that, um, that there, there are uh, various sort of missions on the go to try and uh, try and make that happen. So, um, you know, watch this space. Maybe um, maybe the Palatine landfill will, <laughs> will appear. I, uh, I'm 100% sure on Central News back in the day, it showed you dumping these action figures and i mean they were absolutely hundreds and hundreds of these figures going into this landfill and uh, and i can remember almost rolling my eyes out my mum was like oh what a wa-. she kept saying oh what a waste <laughs> i remember saying it what a waste especially in a landfill also in this exhibition matt is you got some great movie posters from yeah. the Odeon on display as well and uh, so I, I i must admit i did take photos of every single poster yeah, because <laughs> right? I was like, I've not seen the, them uh, as a set for a very long time, and um, the way they did them back in the day, just beautiful. I tell you what, people who do posters for films now should go to your exhibition and have a look how they were done <laughs> and go, yeah, let's get them out like that. Yeah, because they're just beautiful bits of work, you know. Bit yeah, of I mean, it, it's a, a genuine painting. Um, that's what movie posters were, and a. Uh, it, it seems hard to imagine now because we're so used to seeing the sort of the Photoshop aesthetic. But um, it was a case of an artist um, with paintbrushes just just paint making his painting. And um, you know the the problem was that the, uh, you know if today that's done and an executive says, oh actually you know could we have um, you know uh, ordinary and Reich a little bit larger in this one here, or we'd like we'd like that Millennium Falcon a bit more to the left, or can we have that element of it a bit bit bigger? then that's just a job of a few moments on Photoshop. But uh, with a painting, you'd have to rip it up and start again. So um, that was obviously what made um, made movie posters um, sort of become mm. this sort of digital format around 1990. And um, it happened incredibly quickly, it has to be said. Um, when Photoshop was introduced, um, the, the movie painted, that movie, uh, painted poster died almost overnight. But um, 
yeah, something something really was lost because when you see these paintings, um, they're so evocative and um, the, the the artist always sort of wrote checks that the movie couldn't cash and uh, often you saw these awful mm. B movies and the the painting would be amazing. There'd be dinosaurs and there'd be volcanoes yeah, and there'd be busty women and heroes with huge uh, muscles and all of this stuff. And um, when you actually yeah. saw the movie, it was it was it was fairly poor. But um, in the case of Star Wars. Um, uh, you know the movie kind of managed to live up to the paintings, even as good as the uh, as the posters were. So um, I, I I think they are fantastic things. I I really enjoyed collecting posters, and um, I've put together a collection of of every single British movie poster for the original Star Wars films, except for one. There's there's one that I haven't never managed to get, but um uh, hopefully one day I'll I'll track that down. But um I mm. think they're beautiful things, and um I, I'm really pleased that we can sort of you know present them in uh, a gallery in in a, in a yeah. museum yeah. where they belong because they, they they look like they belong just as much as any picasso or any monet does uh, they're absolutely. legitimate works of art mm, absolutely now i did notice that you had um two posters in particular from the original 1977 uh, star wars one is an iconic piece of artwork by tom that's right Chantwell? yeah tom Chantwell. Chantwell. I love that. I never knew about this other one that, that you've got in your display. Never knew there was another one that was uh, commissioned, didn't win out, and that was by Tom Bouvet. That is remarkable. And I was like, wow, I, I couldn't believe it, seeing an original piece after so long of looking at the original, you know, the, the original, and now I'm looking at this uh, alternative bit. My only, if I had to pick out um, uh, a flaw in it was... Princess Leia is shooting her laser and she doesn't care where she's shooting it. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, looking over here, a gun's at it, and she's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, woman, put that gun on, save it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's a fantastic bit of artwork. And um, uh, and you've got the full, you've got the uh, the original post there and and, and um, if any viewers do go to the, to the exhibition, you can have the opportunity to buy a print of it. I couldn't afford it. I have to say, Matt. So I got the postcard. Yeah, I mean that, that is really the, the star exhibit. The, um, the 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 posters were commissioned um, by 20th Century Fox when they wanted a new poster for the uh, for the UK release and the international campaign. So um, uh, a couple of British artists uh, had a go at it. Tom Chantrell and his friend Tom Beauvais. They they both um, painted a treatment and they took them along to 20th Century Fox. Um, this would have been in uh, in probably mid 1977. And, uh, and and they showed them to uh, uh, to Fox, and, and, and they chose the Chantrell image, which um, the Chantrell image is the one where Luke Skywalker is sort of firing directly at the viewer, Han Solo's firing off to the side, and they're all firing in different directions, and it's become probably the it, what was certainly one of the top five most famous movie posters ever, and uh, you can see why they chose that one. But um, Tom Bovey's uh, painting equally stunning, but uh, was wasn't needed, so he just rolled it up took it home and uh he's had it at home for the last 40 years and hasn't been shown and um i can't believe that it's he, unbelievable he, uh, i got in touch with him and um he was a, lo a lovely chap and he also did various other paintings he's painted for mad max uh uh fantastic voyage um blade runner so he did some other really great um uh, sci-fi and fancy type genre posters um he was happy to loan it uh, for the exhibition he wanted a he wanted it to be seen really it had been unseen for so long so um we, we've displayed it and um yes all, all the other posters in the exhibition are printed movie posters but this is an actual painting it's the original piece that uh that he painted back in 77 and um yeah it's, it's fantastic that we're able to share it yeah it's an amazing piece and uh, if any of the like I say if any of the listeners get the chance to visit the exhibition Go and have a look at this poster. It is absolutely beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of artwork. Also, <laughs> walking round, I took uh, I, something that popped out to me was a wanted poster for um, a stolen cassette. Uh, well, a stolen yes. film reel. This... And I was like, <laughs> what? Yeah, this was... What's um, that about? This was about if, if you lived through the early 80s, then um, you will probably remember lots of news about video piracy. And video piracy was this massive threat to the film industry. And um, basically, movie studios back in the early 80s, they, they, they kind of realized that video was going to be a big thing. Um, but they didn't really know 
how to handle the piracy element that it was fairly easy to make a copy of a video and uh, and and then distribute it so they weren't quite sure what to do and um uh, there was a big hoo-ha when a, um, a 35 millimeter print of Return of the Jedi was stolen from uh, a cinema in Hastings in Kent, and um, and pirate tapes were made were made from it. Um, so it was such a big deal that um, Lucasfilm and 20th Century Fox uh, uh, created a special poster. A 5,000 pound reward was offered for the return of this print, and um, 5,000 pounds back in 1983. I mean, that's that's a lot of money, uh, proper money. And um, yeah. it's an official, it's an officially issued Lucasfilm poster. So uh, uh, I was very pleased to get one of these because there's not too many of the, this poster around. So uh, it's it's a nice little bit of history, although it's not a um, it's not a poster with any pit, sort of picture or artwork on it. Um, it's certainly a little historical moment of uh, of, of of when the theft was made. Yeah. Uh, well, two things, Matt. Is how did you get that poster? And the second one is. I can't believe someone's stolen um, <laughs> the the reel. And if that is because it says um, it's never been no, found, it, ne- has it? It, it never it never turned up. Despite massive uh, you know massive publicity, it was actually on the news. You can uh, you can go onto Google and you can you can uh, uh, you can sort of go on YouTube rather and uh, look for a stolen Return of the Jedi print, and you'll see it was on the news in America. Film Return of the Jedi, despite it being protected by the biggest security operation ever mounted for a film. The copy was snatched in a break-in at a cinema in Hastings in Sussex, and it's feared it may be used to make thousands of illegal pirate videos of the space adventure film. Return of the Jedi opened in London's West End just over two weeks ago. It had broken all box office records in America and has drawn big audiences here too. As we reported, strong measures were taken to guard every single copy of the film. But it now looks as if the video pirates have got hold of at least one of them and the security operation could have been in vain. In cities across the states, people often camped out for days just to secure a place in the queue. But any internationally successful movie runs the risk of being copied onto video cassette, which is illegal. Of course, it's much easier to watch a film in the comfort of your own home on your television screen. But the movie makers reckon that the video pirates, as they're known, is costing their business something like 300 million pounds a year. The company putting out the film are taking strong measures to make sure only paying customers see it. They're hoping the video pirates won't be able to get near the film. When the uh, picture was ready to be shipped to England, we had a security lady escorted to the airport and put on the plane first class. The seat next to her was occupied by the cans of film and she sat there next to them for the whole flight and when she arrived in England she was met and uh, driven to the laboratory and the cans of film were immediately placed into a vault. Every copy made of the film has been specially catalogued and where each one goes will always be known. The makers wouldn't confirm it but it's believed a new process in making the prints will stop them being copied. One thing is certain the cost of the security operation is enormous, all to ensure that this film, with its exciting scenes, will only be viewed in cinemas. It made the news across the pond. It was on the news here in the UK, and it, you know it's great seeing this sort of older archival footage of the story being told. Um, I, yeah. I managed to um, persuade a, a fellow collector to, to part with it and to sell it to me. Um, but yes, it's it's not a, it's not a poster that will come up for sale. Uh, very often if at all so it, it, it is a rarity yeah can you imagine in somebody's attic somewhere in hastings is a print of return of the jedi <laughs> it's like you're sitting on a gold mine right there yeah do you imagine if someone finds it and says can i uh, hand this in for the reward <laughs> <laughs> be amazing wouldn't it um right. but you know funny enough about video piracy i did talk, i talked to, to mark newbold of fancy tracks and i actually did get a VHS copy. My dad brought it back when he was driving out, driving in his lorry. Somebody sold him a video copy and brought it back to me, and I was like, "Wow, I've got a copy of it." Yeah, you know what I mean, of the film. Of course, I, I watched it hundreds and hundreds of times at the cinema, but it was good to get a copy of it. But you know, those people. This wasn't a copy of the print, though. This was somebody had filmed it in this cinema with a with a big massive camera right. <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. a lot of bootleg copies of return of the jedi did come out after after that theft so um you know it it did it did the job and the, the studios were probably a little bit r- right to be worried about it yeah 
Yeah. Um, also, um, I did notice that with the books that you've got, there was this like a, a souvenir book for Star Wars, the original Star Wars. I've got that, and I remember looking at it and thinking, "Yeah, god damn, I've got that in a box," <laughs> and I'm looking at it in a museum. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, it was. A, it was it's amazing. It was a it? souvenir program that accompanied uh, the, the the first film, and um, it was sold, or you know, in cinema kiosks, uh, you know, on the. It would have been a little pile of them, maybe next to the box office, selling the tickets. And um, mm. uh, yeah, they they did them actually for for all three of the films. They they an, an official souvenir program, and I think they're they're rather lovely things actually. So uh, yeah, it's a nice a nice little uh, keepsake. Well, I didn't get the Empire or the uh, Jedi one. I didn't know, know um, they they did them. Now, um, also with the posters, uh, Matt is um, you had one particular one that image. Um, and I've always thought it was my favourite from Return of the Jedi. It's the one with the red background with Vader's helmet, and you can yes. see them fighting. That is, I love that image. I absolutely yeah. Love that that image. that particular poster is by Drew Struzan, who's um, you know went, went on to become an extremely famous poster artist after mm. that, and um, has, he did all the prequel posters and um, the special edition posters as well for Star Wars. Um, but that yeah. that is maybe his most avant-garde poster because it's really just a blood red image as you say with um uh the, the sort of silhouetted image of uh vader and uh, yeah. luke having having their duel so um it, it's, it's a very striking poster and um of course when that first came out it was the pre-release poster so um it said revenge of the jedi and uh yes the the, the american um Americans basically had to sort of have that post withdrawn, but uh, quite a few of the revenge ones managed to sort of get out into circulation anyway. So um, that became quite a valuable poster if you had it saying revenge rather than return. Just um, just quickly before we wrap this up, I noticed you had a, a rancor there when that toy came out. I was amazed with that toy as well because of I, how I, big I it think was. they did a brilliant job with the rancor monster. It, and as you say, it's um, it, it's well scaled, and m- most of the um, toys, obviously, the scale is. Is is a little bit iffy because um, it costs a fair amount in plastic. So um, uh, when when you got the Star Destroyer playset, you were rather disappointed. That it was it wasn't really the size of a Star yeah. Destroyer. It was about the size. It didn't even look like about it. the size of a shoebox. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah. The, but the Rancor. Wow, I mean that was a a, a fantastic uh, looking toy and uh, and scaled correctly to the figures. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, when they brought it, I've got um, the Jabba the Hutt one. Yes, as well. that was again the Jabba toy was 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 nice because it was um it was a playset, but it was also the character himself, wasn't it? Um, mm, yeah. And, and as you say, you you move the uh, you move the head, the tail wiggles. He's got his uh, he's got his sort of like a uh, hocker pipe there, so he can he can take a uh, take a drag on whatever he's smoking. And uh, and you also yeah. get Salacious Crumb, the little action figure. There is that uh, he's not not an articulated figure, but he's his tail does move, but um, he, he's mm. just sort of made so he can just sort of sit on the edge of uh, of Jabba's toilet or whatever, or wherever his throne it may be. And um, yeah, yeah, that that was a, that again, you know, a very, a very popular playset that one. Yeah, it is. No, uh, um, what you said about uh, you collecting from one time to another. Um, would you are you interested in that uh, brand new the sail barge? Um, uh, yeah, I have actually. I I. I... I have um I've put my money down and I've I've sort of paid the pre advance for one of those um that's the only time that I have gone with it because uh, the Jabba sail barge was originally going to be one of the items in the vintage toy line and um, as you've seen from my exhibition I've got I've got an interest in the unproduced toys so the toys that were planned by Kenner but weren't actually made and um, they actually you know Ralph McQuarrie it was actually who sketched up the des- design. Um, and they, they've Kenner have actually made a patent on the uh, on the sail barge toy, um, and finally um, Hasbro are going to create this. So I had to be in on that one. So I had to be. So I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to, to getting that. And wouldn't that display well inside a big cabinet in a museum as well? You know, filled with God, yeah. filled with Jabba's goons. And uh, so hopefully, uh, the in, may the toys be with you in a few years time from now. If it goes on to another museum, we might have one of those barges um, in in there. That'd be great. Yeah, it looked good with next to your. Yes, normal yeah, skin. no, it would it be quite quite well scaled, skin, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it would. I have to say that I was I really wanted to put my money down on it, but I just did not have the money to throw down it. But um, I'd be interested to see one up close. They have, they um, didn't. Uh, know, James, I have to say they um they they didn't make it easy or attractive for for British collectors. Um, no, to they do didn't. that. Um, 
it was it was a it was a good option for for US collectors, but um for British collectors they they made it awfully difficult. You had to sort of jump through all sorts of hoops and um, and you know pay a lot more money. So I, I managed to find a friendly um chap over in the states who's going to sort of you know get it for me and send it out to me. Mm. Um, but um yeah, it's a shame that they didn't think of uh, of international collectors, and it was really just an offer mm. to to, uh, to the US. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Matt, what's next for your exhibition? What's what's next? Uh, it's for going it? to go to the Royal Albert Hall, actually, which is going to be quite exciting. Um, the London Philharmonic Orchestra are going to be accompanying a screening of Star Wars over a weekend, um, and they want to sort of dress the Royal Albert Hall with um, Star Wars, uh, you know, posters and memorabilia. So. Uh, it's going to be there, so I, I I don't really know where I'll go from there. Oh, it's all it's all downhill off that. Really, I tickets it? for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I'd like be, to go see that. Yeah, it's going to be epic, isn't it? Anyway, it's been absolutely a pleasure speaking to you, Matt. And um, if any of our listeners want to get in contact with you or find out more about your exhibitions, On where Facebook, can they go? Uh, may the toys be with you. That's probably the best the best spot for it. Um, you can uh, get in touch with me, send me send me a message through there, or um, uh, or you can see me posting in various vintage Star Wars collector groups as Matt Fox. And um, uh, it's on at New Walk Museum in Leicester, and it's free to visit. October the 28th is when it closes. But um, uh, I hope there's some listeners maybe to sort of, uh, you know, pop along and uh, take the kids maybe um, and enjoy the exhibition. Mm, uh, absolutely and on your way out listeners there's a little donation box because the new walk museum has always been 100 percent free but there is a donation box and i and i do say if you can just put a couple of quid in it helps to keep the museum running and um i i always donate every time i go in absolute pleasure well it's been absolutely fantastic speaking to you matt and um please feel free to come back at any time you want to talk about the wars collecting anything this mic and these doors are open oh to you brilliant anytime. brilliant yeah no it's been it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for um for thinking of me and um you know for, for having me i, I, I do appreciate it no thank you it's been, it's been brilliant what a nice chat matt fox was and it was a right pleasure having a good chat with him now it's time for some music, I think. Um, Jason, how are you with remixes? Do you like remixes? I love them. Yeah. Now, this came out quite some time, but I was looking around on YouTube, right? These two lads called French Fuse published this Star Wars remix on the on December the 10th, 2015. I'd never seen this until about a week ago. But um, I sent them a message saying, can I use your tune? And they, they were good enough to send me one back saying, yes, not a problem. So they've done a Star Wars remix. Now, this video has had over 6,000 views, which is not bad in my in my. Not book. bad, no. Not no, bad. It's great. And it's a bit of, um, what could we say? It's a bit of um, techno drum and bass could say mm-hmm. but it's very good they use a lot of uh, sounds as well from the film so so um enjoy let's listen we are french views
Well, that was absolutely fantastic. And you know what, Jason? It's the end of the show. Uh, well, that went fast. I know, it did. <laughs> it did. And it I love that remix, by the way. That was that was really great. And if you, it, you know, not only listening to it, but it, 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 if you watch their video yeah. as well, uh, it's actually quite fun to watch, too. It is, especially how the one's wearing a Darth Vader mask and one's wearing a Yoda mask. Mm-hmm. I shall stick a link to it for these French fuse, some good guys. And uh, if you get a chance, have a look. <laughs> have a look at their their um, iPhone ringtone remix. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they do a fantastic iPhone remix. Oh, cool. <laughs> it sent my missus nuts when I played it the other day. Well, what a fantastic show. It's been absolutely fantastic having you, Jason, talking about your print. Well, I, and, yeah, uh, thank you for having me. Oh, I really not, appreciate it. Oh, yeah, I, like, I love being back. Ah, I'll tell you what, you're welcome at any time, Jason. At any time, especially coming for Halloween. You know what I mean? Might be something Ooh. in the pipeline for that as well. But um, it's, it's like I said before, Jason, it's always good to have you on the show. You know what I mean? Like, you're all wel- welcome back at any any time. You make a great co host. That's even better. You know what I mean? Oh, thanks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we could chat for hours. And we literally did we chat for hours. <laughs> we did. We did. Now, Jason, what have, uh, is. What have you got coming up? But you know, is there anything that's coming up that um, any of the listeners would be interested in? Well, I got the New York Comic Con mm-hmm. coming up first week in October. I think it's what the fourth to the seventh. Uh, my dad and I will be there. My dad's my new Comic Con buddy. He's yeah. he's he, he's so awesome. Uh, people actually, you know, ask me, "Hey, is your dad coming?" So he's he's become quite popular. Yeah. <laughs> with people and uh, they love him and he's a great salesman uh, I just kind of sit back and watch him go and he's, he's he, he loves it it's a, a great great opportunity for us to get together and, and when my son you know when we we're in Portland you know all three of us you know three generations all doing Star Wars stuff together it's so, it's fantastic but anyways New York Comic Con uh, two weeks after that I'm at a retro gaming expo here in Portland Oregon which is loads of fun Every retro arcade game you could possibly imagine, from arcade games to home game systems, are there to play with for free, mm-hmm. and tons of great vendors. Awesome. Uh, great, great show. Uh, and then after, and then nothing planned until uh, Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle, which is March, and then fingers crossed in April, I'm at uh, Star Wars Celebration again. Oh, so. that's sweet. That's sweet. And um, um, if anybody wants to get your prints, Jason, where can they go? Where can they go and get your amazing prints? Basically, two places you can get them online. You can go to my website, which is jasonwchristman.com. Uh, my prints are about. You know, 20% more than they are at this other site, which I'll give you in a second, only because all of my prints are signed by me and and shipped by me. But the other site you can get them at is darkinkart.com, which is a company that Acme Archive uh, does all the licenses prints for me. Uh, That's who I go through to get them done. And that's their website. And they have them, uh, you know, they're about 20% less than what I sell them for, but they're not signed prints. They're just uh, straight, uh, you know, you know, from the limited edition mm-hmm. series, the same series I sell from as well. I have to buy my own prints to sell them on my website, believe it or not. But that's just how it works. Yeah. <laughs> that's strange. Yeah. It is strange. Yeah, it is strange. But, yeah. Now, um, do you know, I, I was thinking about this, uh, Jason. Do you do... Can you get like your prints on like magnets or coffee cups or um, uh, no. key rings or anything like that? No, uh, not that they can't be. I mean, if if a licensed vendor who sells coffee mugs uh, dug into the Lucasfilm archives and and liked my work and wanted it on a mug and they had. A license approval to do that yes it it can very well end up on an easter basket or a mug at some point in time oh, yes. all right right it's just that um uh, i was just thinking that because uh, I've, I've bought coasters in my time and mm-hmm. key rings and, uh, and everyone loves fridge magnets and you do see an awful lot of um posters on fridge magnets and i mm-hmm. thought you know especially you know know your collections of um of of the um, like your Vader, your your Luke, your Leia, and your Han, you know all those ones. Um, mm-hmm, yeah, you know as them as individual magnets look great. 
and you know I me mean? to yeah. get them all because they're so small and in your in the because i've got like a, um uh, an american size um fridge you know with the big two doors the big massive ones so right. so when i do collect my missus goes mad about it but i do collect these amenities <laughs> and it'd be great to get them you know make you fit your entire collection on the side of a of a sure a fridge. Yeah. yeah now um so that's great so the fans can go to those sites for your prints as well so that's fantastic now jason where can people find you on twitter and facebook and instagram uh, no, I, I I'm on. I have a Twitter account, but I'm I'm rarely ever there. All, all of my latest whatever is on Instagram. Yeah. And my Instagram handle is Star Wars Artist, uh, all one word. I got that a long time ago, and I've held on to it ever since. Even though I'm not the only Star Wars artist. Don't but blame that's... you. <laughs> but we've said this but every time is, you've said it. That's my handle. Yeah. Don't blame you. That is such a cool handle. Fantastic. And remember, you can show your love for this podcast with an official Radio Free End or T-shirts available at Tee Public. Also, iTunes is the best place to download us. And while you're there, please leave us a five-star review. You can also reach out to us on social media. So search for us on Instagram, Twitter, and on Facebook. We are at Radio Free Endor. You can find me at Jamie underscore R underscore Burns. And our email is RadioFreeEndor at gmail.com. And we're a part of the Southgate Media Group of network and also just leaves me to say bye bye and thank you for listening and join us again for our halloween episode so take care and see you later bye bye have a great night i'm back i just wanted to say that if you have got any spooky or ghost stories send them in and we'll be playing them next month how about that one remember the spookier the better <laughs>